everybody. Welcome to my very first podcast, Unfiltered with Holly Randall. And today I am super excited to have two of the most important people in my life for my very first interview. That would be my parents, Suze Randall and Humphrey Knipe. Oh, you're being so nice to me. I wow. am being nice to you, but only, we should only do when this I'm being more recorded. often. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get right into it. Um, if if you guys don't know who I am and who my mother is, well, first of all, shame on you. Second of all, um, you can check us out. You can look us up online. Uh, her website is suze.net. My website is hollyrandall.com. We both also have Wikipedia pages, and we were recently featured in a Netflix documentary called Hot Girls Wanted Turned On, where the first episode, which is Women on Top, and I think that that's a fantastic introduction into like kind of what we're all about and who my mom is as a person and her influence in the industry. So um, <laughs> if you don't know who Suze Randall is, she is probably one of the most important and prolific and influential female erotic photographers in the world, to be honest. I mean, when I first came into this industry 18 years ago, um, she was the creme of the creme. And I was definitely brought into this industry in um, really like at the highest level possible. I worked in what I call the Suze bubble, and I kind of keep that alive to this day. So uh, let's start off with a little bit of background. So, um, Mom, tell us a little bit about your childhood and growing up and where you come from and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, I come from Worcestershire in England, and we lived in the country. Um, very normal, ordinary family. My father was a physical ed trainer, teacher, and my mum was a nurse from Australia. They met in the war and came over to England and uh, we had a we had a great life, um, horses, and they didn't have any money, but they worked so hard, and then rich people used to lend me horses, and I used to ride for my county. Um, it was a pretty good life. Went to an all-girls school. I'm surprised I wasn't expelled, but other than that... Um, well, I know that you definitely had some interesting incidents when you were younger. And these were um, kind of one of my, my life lessons growing up was uh, my parents told me to always, it was, it's interesting, this is something different than what most parents tell you to do. They told me to always question authority and always do what you believe was right. So um, I know that you definitely had some run-ins with your teachers when you were younger. Yes, it was a family tradition though. I mean, even my aunt hoisted her underwear up on the flagpole outside the old girls' school. Um, I forgot so, that story. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was a family tradition not to be bullied by authority and to... Uh, so I, that's really what made my success, was not being bossed around by big bully boys and just scheming and weeming and doing the right thing. Using your feminine wiles, yeah, as they would say. Yeah, it's a big advantage to be a woman <laughs> when you're younger. <laughs> By the time you get older, you need to be rich and powerful, but uh, when you're younger, you can play with everybody. Um, so, Dad, what about you? You had a pretty normal upbringing as well, right, in South Africa? Being brought up in apartheid South Africa normal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe not so normal. So tell us a little bit about your childhood. Well, it's the darkest Africa. I shot animals. And I uh, visited farms. And I lived in a little port city of East London. Not anything to do with London. It was just in the Indian Ocean. Riddled with fleas, I remember. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I Sorry, really guys, if there's anybody from East London listening. It's great. <laughs> great, great, great place. Stay there. I remember you told me that you didn't even see a television until you were 25, is that right? First time I saw a TV is when I, in England, in England, when I was 25. Because TV was not, was banned under apartheid in South Africa. Was it? Yes. See, there, I didn't really know that. There's no TV. Interesting. Because it would introduce foreign influences. Wow. And we wanted to keep things as they were in the Middle Ages. That is crazy. So um, when did you actually, so you ended up moving to England. So tell us a little bit about that, leaving South Africa. Well, it was the swinging 60s when I saw a cover of a girl in a miniskirt on the cover of Time magazine. No, it was, yeah, Time magazine. I thought, I'm out of here. 
Because we didn't have things like miniskirts in South Africa, you'd have thrown in jail probably. Wow. No, it's not true. But you nearly. Okay, so you you came to England and what like what happened when you first got there? Like tell me about, you know, when you first got off the plane, what did you do for work? Where did you live? Well, I lived with a friend for a few weeks until I got a job as a teacher. Because that's what I I did journalism and also taught a bit in South Africa. So uh, what I remember most is the first night I spent in London, I, I watched my first TV show. I think he got me high on something. I didn't even know what it was. I just remember crying with laughter. <laughs> I couldn't believe it was a comedy show. <laughs> I couldn't believe this this thing that just was a movie in your house. I mean, it was that primitive, really. Wow, that's amazing. Probably John Cleese. Monty Python? Probably. Monty Python is the best. We are big Monty Python fans here. Actually, my parents knew John Cleese back in the day, right? Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> Very funny guy. He read your book, Dad, didn't he? Yeah, he loved it. So, um, so my dad wrote a book. He's written a couple of books, actually. He's a writer. So, Dad, Loads tell us of books. So, tell us a little bit about. Um, well, tell us about your first novel. Well, the first the first book I wrote, I wrote with a old school friend of mine. It was called The Dominant Man. Not that I was. I was just writing about the great and wonderful people that were dominant. <laughs> It was based on the pecking order in human in in animal society and how it expressed itself in human society. That actually was published in five languages. I thought I was going to be rich and famous. I was neither. <laughs> well, I remember our our cousin or my cousin Jessica, your brother's daughter, told me that she was actually ha- had to read that book in school. Yes, it was. It was uh, Nick found it. My son found it in a, in a university library in Santa Barbara. I was terribly impressed to see his father next to the greats <laughs> in the book in the library. Uh, but that was the end of that. Well, I think you're one of the greats, Dad. <laughs> um, okay, so let's move on to one of my favorite stories when you guys met. So tell me about that, because I love that story. Well, I was I went on a blind date. With one of my roommates. I was a nurse with seven other nurses living in an apartment in Earl's Court. And it was my birthday party, I think. Your 22nd birthday Yeah. That's, I mean, that's crazy. That's how long you guys have been together. It's like so amazing. So, but anyways, okay, go on. It's 1968. Yeah, so Humphrey was fixed up with, um, was it Liz? Her name was Liz, yeah. yeah. I never met her before. She was just a blind date. I uh, know. I was supposed to meet at the party. Then I walked in and there was this gorgeous animal standing by the fireplace, ogling me with a, with a dress which exposed these beautiful abs. Yeah, she had, you had your shirt had tied a, up, right? Yeah, I had a short shirt on and showing off my stomach. And I, this guy came in looking, his hair parted in the middle, just like my father had done in years past. And in a striped blazer. In a striped blazer, just like my dad. And I, I went, wow. I got so embarrassed, I went and changed my top. Because <laughs> to... she saw me ogling her. <laughs> and then so after, after I'd had a good ogle, she disappeared upstairs. I thought she was going to come down something really flimsy. <laughs> no, she came down dressed like a school a teacher. shirt. <laughs> But then I had a drink and then and I went back. And then she had a lot of drinks, a lot of champ- <laughs> cheap champagne. And then upstairs again came down in the sexy outfit. <laughs> then I knew she was mine. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love that. So you guys started talking, obviously. And then, like, I mean, so what was your first date then? Well, after the party, she, she, she walked with me to the bus. To the bus stop, yeah. The bus stop was going to take me home, and we kissed and chased a little kiss, and that was that, I thought. Then she tracked me down. <laughs> <laughs> My life has not been the same since. <laughs> so, I mean, what do you mean she tracked you down? Like, she found you? Like, she showed up at your house? I mean, what do you mean by that? I had a detective agency. I don't, I don't know, actually, the details, sordid details. But we saw each other frequently from then on. I think you called me. Oh, I probably did. Yeah. Oh, well, it was my fault then. <laughs> and, I mean, 
And you guys have been together ever since, which is amazing, first of all, in this in this world where like everyone's divorced all the time. But um, you guys also like had a, I mean, okay, so not to advertise another podcast, but I have to say when you guys did the Rialto report, I mean, I know your story, but I had never heard it cohesively in, in one piece. And I, and there were some things that you guys actually talked about that I hadn't heard about before, but I mean, definitely what I walked away from that podcast was like, holy shit, my parents are so fucking cool. Like so much cooler than I am. You guys have a way more interesting life and a story. So, um, I guess let's, let's jump forward to how you started, how you became a photographer mom. Oh, well, it was a long it was a long haul. I mean, I was a nurse when I met Humphrey and he was going to be this rich and famous author and it never happened. Um, and we were struggling for money and nurses those days had just got paid like 20 pounds a week or something. I loved nursing, but, um, I decided to make some money on the side and I answered an ad in an underground newspaper, International Times for nude modeling, which is something that nice girls did not do in those days. Um, the guy fell off his chair when I walked in the office. But uh, I wore a wig that my mother had given me and I did some topless shots with a really sweet photographer who just had a baby and we had a good time. And I was quite good. I was surprised. Um, and finally, I, I met an, a photographer who said, for heaven's sake, keep your clothes on. And he gave me a fashion job. And then it escalated from there, and I, I left the nursing job, which was which well, I loved. She started shooting uh, fellow models behind the scenes. Okay, but that so was down the road. Yeah, that was after your layout in Vogue magazine, correct? Because you went yeah. and bought a camera after that. Yeah, yeah. I got, I got a layout in Vogue magazine. I thought I was going to be the next Chris, Chrissy Shrimpton. And I thought I was going to be famous. So I went out down Bond Street and conned a cameraman, a f camera shop into selling me a camera and conned my bank manager into lending me the money. And I started um, shooting my girlfriends behind the scenes, you know, on fashion sh shots, fashion shows and things like that and um, selling them to the Sun newspaper because... I had the, the nice. Famous, I had the famous page three layout, yeah. topless layout in those days. And the great thing about doing nudes is that you own the pictures. I mean, if you want to be a photographer, it's just like wanting to be a model. You've got to go and interview with all these people that you have to impress. And it's really horrible. You don't have control of your life. Uh, so doing nudes was great. I owned the pictures. I'd pay the models myself. And uh, it's, in ankle, it's interesting ankle. how much like financial um, freedom that you have in in shooting nudes. And just yeah, the 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 there's so many different avenues that you can sell those pictures to. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah, it's really great, um, especially with the internet. That was down the road, but when the internet exploded, I was the only photographer who owned all my pictures because I kept fighting with the big boys, with Playboy and Penthouse and Hustler. You know, I'd work for them, and then I, we'd get into arguments, and I'd get thrown out, so I'd be shooting for myself again. So it was kind of good because I owned those pictures. Yeah. I, I had a huge library. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you probably have the largest private erotic library in the world. I'm pretty, I'm pretty fucking sure that nobody can beat you on that. Yeah, it was because I kept getting thrown out <laughs> by, by the magazines because they didn't like my attitude, whereas all the other photographers would be lock, stock and barrel, right. getting paid and doing what they were told, you know, all the boys club. But I was this um, rebellious chick who wanted to do what she wanted to do and... Uh, and it ended up it, serving you really well in the end. Yeah, it's interesting it did. how that is. Yeah, yeah, I have to thank my grandfather for giving me that bad attitude. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let's move on to when you came to America and started shooting for Playboy. So tell us a little bit about how that happened. Well, that happened because uh, Humphrey discovered a page three girl, Lillian Muller, um, and we interviewed her, and I started shooting her, and she actually stayed in our apartment for a while and I presented the pictures to Victor Lowndes who 
we knew party wise in London, and he was half second in command at Playboy, and he sent the pictures to to Playboy here in America, and half fell in love with her, and they flew us both over. I mean. I was lucky he flew me over because I was a chick. He would not have flown a male photographer over. I mean, I tell you, I had, I had it sewn up. Being a girl was such an advantage. Um, and then when I got off the plane here in California, there was no way I was going back. Yeah. And Playboy tried to persuade me that I, because I didn't know what I was doing anyway, um, except I was a good model and good with models. But they told me, you know, lighting nudes and food is so difficult, you need to learn more. And I didn't have a choice. I said, well, I'll have to sell my pictures to Penthouse then, won't I? So they said, okay, we'll help you. And they gave me a job. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I'm so lucky. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, honestly, like uh, Hugh Hefner is responsible for my mom's green card and my dad moving here and me being born in this country. So we actually have a lot to thank Playboy for. So Yeah, and they taught me a lot. Marilyn Grabowski, you know, just building sets, draping and the lighting. I mean, it was... Yeah, because this is back before Photoshop days. I don't know if some of you younger listeners may not remember, but we used to shoot on this thing called film (laughs) and we used to not have Photoshop. And, um, you know, it used to be a lot different. Like there wasn't really any retouching. So when the girl had issues or, you know, bruises or whatever, that was something that you had to fix in camera. It wasn't something that you could fix in post. And that was something that you taught me very much. And, and I'm still true to this day. Like I really try to get things perfect in camera. I feel like this generation of photographers now with the technology and Photoshop and iPhones and all that kind of stuff, people just shoot whatever and then they fix it later, you know? And I feel like that's kind of taken some of the artistry out of photography, um, which has been kind of frustrating for me because I was taught very much about getting it right in camera on set at that time, not necessarily fucking with it later so draping it drape yeah my mom is very famous for her draping and her her blue silks and if you look at back at any of her old photos you'll see a lot of like especially if it's a bedroom set there'll be like bed you know sheets kind of draping off the edge of the bed and like kind of spilling onto the floor and it's very like it's draping, very Suze Randall <laughs> draping over creases in the waist right exactly like yeah. using like wardrobe to hide like you know certain body flaws stuff like that so it's uh, but yeah, it's, it's, but it's time consuming. I mean, in the old days, <clears throat> they used to shoot a penthouse layout in one day, or more than that, right? No, no I more. spent three days doing a penthouse layout. I mean, centerfold. I mean, three days. But these days, you're lucky if you get one day. Yeah, I mean, one day, and not only do you have to shoot the entire centerfold, but you have to shoot all the video that goes along with it. Maybe an interview, something like that. It's just like. It's crazy. It's crazy how much it's changed. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's a big difference between, you know, today and, and back in my parents' day. You know, they really had a lot of time to spend on shooting the pictures. And it was really just about photos then. And now it's just about video. And photos are kind of like second, which is, you know, which is hard for me because I, at my heart, I'm still very much a photographer. And I shoot video and I like shooting video. But, you know, it, I, I just, Photography is is my first love, but there's just not that much of a market for it anymore. It's really like all about video these days, and photos just kind of like illustrate what happens in the in the video scene. So it's definitely been like a big shift there. And I know that yeah, that the was photos are used to promote the video. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. We were, we were lucky because it was so frowned upon. It was not the sort of thing that you did nudes, and that, that was shocking, and everybody wanted it. And now everybody does it and it's like, oh, you know, everybody's got plastic surgery and everybody's got this and that. And it's not the same. It was, it was great to have a band be doing something that was not approved of. I know you love doing things that are not approved of. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Not approved of and all the way to illegal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, you guys had like the vice squad like going through your trash and stuff like that, right? I mean, tell me a little bit about shooting porn back when it was legal, back before the Freeman case, which is actually a case that um, legalized pornography in California, California specifically. 
So tell us a little bit about that, you know, well, back when you guys were what renegades. What the authorities were doing was using the pimping and pandering statutes to apply to pornography. So uh, the Friedman case you refer to was he appealed being convicted as a, as a pimp for taking nude pictures. Right. And that was appealed all the way to the California Supreme Court. And uh, they threw it out. So they, they ruled in his favor. Right. And ever since then, it's legal. But it used to be really scary when it's illegal because the pimping and battering penalties were extreme. Minimum three years in jail. Wow. And this is, what, what year is this? So this is about the late 80s. Okay, so I was alive then. I had been born. Yeah. So yes. you guys were worried about possibly going to jail and leaving your daughter <laughs> at home. It wasn't that worried. I mean, the vice kept trying to get things against us, but they could, nobody would speak against us. We didn't do anything wrong. We did, you know, we did our best for everybody. Um, we had a, we, we had Stephen Yagman, who was a, our a friend attorney, who wanted to make some money out of this, and he dragged me down to the court case. Courthouse. Courthouse, where they were trying Jim South, I think, on this pimping and pandering thing. And so for course, the, sorry, just real quick, for those of you who don't know, Jim South was like the big talent agency back in the day. I mean, honestly, he was the only talent yeah. agent. Like he had Jenna Jameson, like he was the only guy. And he he's still in business now, but he doesn't get the quality of girls that he used to. And there's a lot of agencies nowadays, but back in the day, Jim South was the guy. So go on. So yeah, this this friend in quotes, uh, a lawyer introduced <laughs> Introduced me to the vice squad and in the courthouse. In the courthouse, <laughs> I what did I call them? Shoe shine boys. Shoe shine boys. <laughs> he, the, the lawyer was trying to drum up a court case. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Okay, so he was trying to use mom as like uh, a bait, bait to <laughs> she, get them pissy enough. He wanted the enough. cops to bust her so he could defend her. He wanted the cops to bust her. Yes. So yeah. and he knew how kind of like um, how you are. I don't think he knew I was that bad, but... Um. He knew that you might start a fight. <laughs> I think he suspected hoping. that. <laughs> and you did. Yes, I did. <laughs> of course you did. And so they used to go through our trash and look for stuff and interview all the models, but they couldn't get anything against us. And we paid our taxes and we did all the right things. You know, as long as you don't mess with the tax man, you're fine. Yeah, I know that's the one thing you guys always told me, like, don't fuck with the IRS. Just pay your taxes and everything else will be okay. I'm like, a all right. There's a downside to the liberalization of porn is that now everybody in his grandmother does it. Yeah. yeah and that's what I was saying earlier. Yeah, yeah. No, it's really hard. Yeah, and it's free everywhere and so no one pays the for it. The technology is so, so different to yeah. the old film, which used to be a real slap to do. Yeah, so you guys used to okay. So you guys shot some movies back um, in the seventies, and you Eight shot that on mostly. on film, right, Dad? Yes, sixteen millimeter. Sixteen millimeter, and you and that was back when you actually had to cut the film, right, to like make the edits. Like you literally cut the film. It's it's crazy to think about that now. I cut the film, I hang them up in bins. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's so imagine. old school. It's incredible. Imagine. <laughs> What a sweat it was. Yeah. I remember you guys, because, you know, uh, mom was always very much a photographer, but you guys did shoot some movies, like I said, but I remember you always telling me, like, oh, God, shooting movies is like going to war. I didn't it's like just it like so you, much work. You've got to be quiet. That's the trouble. Yeah, it's hard for you. Uh, I, I can't do that. <laughs> I like to be the cheerleader. You know, come on, deeper, faster, harder. When we started shooting video for Suze.net, we used to have to throw my mom out of the studio because she'd be standing there smoking a cigarette, watching the monitor with the two people having sex, and she'd like start doing this kind of weird hip rocking thing that was really <laughs> kind of awkward. And then she'd like start commenting like, "Oh yeah, baby, let's." Marvelous, yes, yes, yes. I'm like, Mom, shut up. We're, sh- we're filming sound. So, like, we literally had to throw her out and, like, not have her there when we shot video because she just <laughs> couldn't keep her mouth okay, shut. No, it's very hard. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so since we're talking about legal cases and all that kind of fun stuff, let's talk about the Tracy Lords debacle because that was a big thing. And I remember that specifically um, when I was a little girl you guys coming to me and one day sitting me down and saying, you know, 
mom and dad might be going to jail and here is the phone number for our lawyer and basically if the cops come and drag us away in the middle of the night, this is who you should call. And I remember being so confused because I couldn't comprehend like why my parents would go to jail and obviously I was too young for you guys to explain the whole situation to me. So tell me a little bit about the whole Tracy Lord story. You go ahead, Humphrey. She was hot stuff. She was a great model. She great was my model. favorite model. I shot, shot about 18 shoots on her. I shot her more than anybody. And she was a wonderful model. Yeah. And you would never have guessed she was underage. She was so promiscuous, so forward. Yeah, she, I mean, she, she even more so in real life than actually on film. I mean, she was so... She, I mean, she embarrassed Buck Henry when we had dinner with him once. I mean, she'd be under the table playing with him. She she'd played be footsie, footsie footsie with him was, under the table. Yeah, she was, at the restaurant in Venice. He was acutely embarrassed. <laughs> he was shuffling in his seat and going red in the face, saying, "Buck, what's the matter?" <laughs> <laughs> no, she was very, very uh, forward. So you would never, never think that she was underage, and I. Those, the, the only good thing that happened out of that was it did make everybody really aware of birth certificates and uh, IDs and things like that. I was the only one who had an ID on her because I took her to England for a Lamb's Navy rum calendar and she had a passport and we, I had all, all the paperwork on her. So when this whole thing blew up, I was able to give other people her fake IDs. But um, but at least that verified the fact that she was falsifying her identity uh, and yeah. falsifying how old she was. Uh, yeah, and no. it wasn't that you guys were shooting somebody knowledge no, of me. No, age. God, no. I God mean, no. who would do such a crazy thing? Yeah, you yeah. And the ruin your is, life. The penalty is extraordinary. Well, it was at 25 years per S offense, right? Something absolutely absurd like that. And, that. and per offense could be like per photo. And you guys shot thousands of pictures on it. Could her. be I per know. frame of movie, it was explained to me. So you've got a million frames in a movie. That's insane. So you could go to jail forever. That's insane. Uh, so it when was you guys, so scary. So tell me about when you guys actually got the news, like what your reaction was, what you did, all of that. Well, I was reading the Metro section of the LA Times and suddenly I saw a headline saying, a uh, poor actress is underage. And I thought, oh, that's weird. Looked and it was Tracy. I nearly... Did something weird in my pants, I can tell you. <laughs> that was, the implications rushed in like a flood of terror, really. I had to break the news to Suze, and she laughed. I laughed. Yeah, I said, that's typical Tracy. <laughs> I mean, I just thought that was so typical. But it wasn't until later I thought about it, and I wondered if she was the one who exposed the truth because we had to destroy every single picture we had of her. All it's so weird in the middle of the night. Ah, shoveling shredding. These, shoveling, shoveling huge kitchen trash bags full of, of uh, film into the car, taking them to empty, what we looked for, empty dumpsters next to supermarkets so we could throw them at the bottom of the dumpster, dumping all these beautiful photographs. That's crazy. Dumpster. So she wiped her slate she, clean. I mean, I don't us know. anyway. But she was still legal in Europe. So you can still get her picture uh, films. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, because with the ages 16 in Europe? 16. Okay. She was such a fabulous model. I, and I was actually very fond of her. She's a great um, girl. But, you know, it just became very awkward, the whole legal system. So we kind of didn't talk to each other anymore. So let me get this right. She used a false birth certificate to get a real driver's license. Is that, yeah. is that right? So the ID that she presented you guys with was actually like a real government-issued ID. Yes. She just mm -hmm. got it under birth false pretenses. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's nuts. Yeah, I mean, we're so diligent about IDs now and paperwork and all that kind of stuff. Um, the adult industry is very careful about that, and I and think that that very much Tracy stems Lords from, that. Yeah, from the Tracy Lord scandal. That's, that's, <laughs> that's nuts. It was scary, though. So tell me um, about... Actually, let's talk about another um, a big star that, you know, people 
very much associate with porn, um, Jenna Jameson. So you shot her a lot back in the day, right? Yeah, she was lovely. She was adorable. Um, you shot her before she got her boob job. Yeah. Like she had, by the way, Jenna had great tits before yeah. she got them done. Like really nice. Like it was, it was a real shame that she did that. Well, plastic surgery is a, is a, you know, girls feel insecure. I mean, when I was young, if I could have had leg extensions, I would have done it. You can actually. It's just <laughs> yeah. incredibly painful and needs really bad scarring, but it does exist. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> That's how girls feel. They feel so insecure. So they, they they go and do plastic surgery and then they do that Then they want to do something else. And by the time they it becomes addictive and by the time they've done it all, they all, you can't tell one person from another. And yeah. it's just really sad. You know what I, I, I love about porn, even though it's kind of interesting because a lot of the girls who've had a lot of plastic surgery, um, you know, do work in porn. But what what I love about porn is that the fact that it embraces like all body types, you know, mm. I mean, there's a fetish for girls with small boobs. There's a fetish for big women, you know, overweight women. There's a fetish for women with big butts, with big boobs. It's like, it's almost like whatever you have, like somebody's into, yeah, somebody's into that. I mean, the whole like <laughs> MILF resurrection, you know, um, it's just interesting because porn really embraces literally all types of women. And, and and that's something that you don't see in any other industry ever, like definitely not mainstream. And and that's one of the things that I kind of love about porn, even though, you know, we're kind of specific about the type of girls that we shoot because we have a very specific niche that we shoot for. I love the fact that like you can kind of, you know, go on, on a campsite or anything like that and you can find any type of girl, um, somebody's into that, you know, and it really embraces all of that. And I just think that that's, that's one of the good things about porn. Um, okay, so let's talk about website. Let's talk about actually, you know what? Let's let's before we get there, let's talk about working for Playboy and getting thrown out of Playboy because that is a very interesting story. And then starting to work for Hustler. Oh, I think I worked for Playboy for like three years, um, and it, there was the big. You know, it was just topless and everything. And then Guccione came along and was showing pubes and everything. So it was this pressure to get hotter uh, that Playboy was very against. And Marilyn used to throw a lot of my pictures out because she thought that they were too too explicit. Um, and then one day I met Larry Flint up at Hefner's um, one of his parties. Okay, but tell us the story behind why Larry Flint was what one of Hefner's parties. Oh, Larry Flint was just blackmailing um, or threatening Hefner as his is his want. Um, he had pictures of Hef with another girl who was not his girlfriend at the time. His girlfriend at the time was Barbie Benton, so Hef didn't want them published. So in order to stop Flint publishing him, he figured that if he just invited him up to Sunday tea party, then that would be good enough, um, which I'm sure it was. Actually, Flint is not not mean. He just likes to cause trouble and stir, stir the dish. So, so there he was at a Hefner garden party, sitting at the bar, being totally ignored by everybody because that's kind of the Americans don't know how to introduce people or anything. Um, so I went up and introduced myself to him, and we got on really well. And he said, well, Sayers, so why don't you shoot yourself for Hustler? Um, I had already shot myself for Playboy. So I said, yeah, why not? Uh, I to promote your book. Uh, my dirty little book, yeah. I, I wrote a dirty little kiss and tell. Actually, technically, Dad wrote it, right? Yeah. I, it was my story. Yeah, I didn't write it. That's why it's so dirty. Daddy wrote it. <laughs> um, about all the people that I partied with, Playboy and... Uh... So, yeah, let me just preface this really quickly. My parents were swingers, so they had a lot of fun back in the day. Yeah, we came from the 60s, you know. It was, it was pre-AIDS, so you could play around and f- fuck around just like the guys and... Uh, it was fun. We were lucky. So what happened? We were, I wrote a story. That's right. And <laughs> I thought I thought Hef knew about it. I kept telling his secretary about this book that we were writing, and she said, "Oh, that's fine. We'll tell him. He won't mind." Um, La di da. Nobody ever told him. 
nobody ever says anything that's going to be awkward or difficult. So um, I was trying to promote it with Hustler and it came out in the news of the world too. And then Hefner had a fit. Because wasn't it, what was the tagline on the cover? Oh, the on the Hustler cover, Playboy photographer shows pink. Yeah, you can see why <laughs> Hef got mad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, that was, that was, um, you know, actually writing the book was, you know, he tried to get me to change things and kept, uh, that was a big pressure fight going on, but he didn't throw me out until I shot myself a hustler. (laughs) And, you know, that is, um, I've seen both layouts. I have to say that your, your Playboy one is, is my favorite. Oh, yeah. uh, It's a little, it's just. It, I don't know. It's it's classier, and I guess it was oh, because Hustler's it was really more... vulgar. You know, whatever. <laughs> were you were you sitting on like large black dildo sculptures for your hustler layout? I don't remember. They were like really, yeah. They they were. I remember. They were like large, like black dildos, but they were like sculptures. So they were like chairs almost. It was really bizarre. Yeah, is. Uh, A privately so. printed edition of the book, Sue's book. Oh, oh really? Sue's oh. by Sue's Randall. Oh, stop promoting it. It's so so Sue's by Sue's Randall is out of print. So if you Thank guys God. want to read it, you have to find it like a used version on eBay. I've actually never read it. $60 plus. Is it really? Oh, wow. So I've actually never read it um, just because I already know my parents' story. And as as much as I know my parents were open sexual individuals, which I think is awesome, I don't necessarily need to read in detail no, about their sordid <laughs> Who wants to know relationships. No. I, mean, I don't want to know that either. I mean, it's you live in the moment and you right. enjoy the moment, then you move on. I mean, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I mean, this is before you guys had kids and this is back when, you know, I mean, look, I've certainly, I'm no angel myself. I have absolutely no, no room to judge. I mean, honestly, you're kind of my, my I hero. You, I thought you were an angel. No. <laughs> you're disappointing on, me now. Come on, Dad. You know better. <laughs> Um, but, I mean, mom slept with a bunch of really interesting celebrities back in the day. Yeah, I was kind. <laughs> <laughs> Generous. Uh, sort of like being the goddess of love. How can you turn anyone down? I mean, really. Even Bill Cosby didn't have to put her to sleep. <laughs> Yeah, so so anyway, oh. so randomly. So we my my family, we already knew we knew about Warren Beatty, we knew about Jack Nicholson, and we knew about Jim um Jim Brown was Jim the, Brown was the only one worth mentioning. Um <laughs> Jim Brown was a huge football star back then. Huge in the day. is the word. Huge football star. Huge. But going back to Bill Cosby, the the first day that I arrived in America, we went to Chicago and we were sitting at Playboy in the the whatever it is, uh, the movie screen, you know, because he's always showing movies. And I sat down. I didn't know anybody, but there's this guy sitting next to me, and it was Bill Cosby. He shoved his hands down my pants. What, right away? Yeah. Before you even talked to him? Yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ. So I said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm up for this. I understood, you know, I understood why he had to drug young girls because he was really rather unattractive. Um, you know, he didn't have to drug me because I was on a mission <laughs> to outdo the guys. <laughs> Fuck more than the guys, embarrass them and everything. But um, <laughs> this is know. why she's my hero. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and your experience with him wasn't very impressive, right? Oh, no, I had to leave and go and find somebody else. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> you couldn't have done that if you were drugged. And no, you couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why. But mind you, I was on my 20th of a drop of acid trip that keeps you sober. So even if he'd given me anything, that would have been an antidote. Interesting. Okay, so yeah, my parents have, um, my mom had this, 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 Theory, or I shouldn't say theory. This but Daddy discovered it. it was- it's a hot new thing. People thought they've just discovered it, but we were using it in the 60s. It's called microdosing. Mm-hmm. Where instead of taking a whole LSD trip, you take a 20th. You just put the, the pill in an eyedropper bottle, add 20 drops of water, get dissolve it, and then take only one drop. Interesting. And that's enough to fight off the fumes of alcohol. 
because it stimulates the system. Keeps you totally sober. Totally and that, sober. That's, that's how come I was able to handle, because Humphrey didn't come over till later. I was in the mansion on my own playing these games with all these guys, but I was able to play it because I was sober. It didn't matter. I mean, otherwise I would have been on my ass drunk and stupid. But uh, So basically we have LSD to thank for your uh, yes. success. It's a really, uh, um, a really good <gasps> trick. Apparently it's that, that microdosing is all in vogue these days. Yeah, they're using it for like treatments now. So they should. It's, yeah. it's amazing. They're looking into like how acid like actually can be very helpful in terms of therapy and stuff like uh, that. People were just ODing on it in the 60s. They were taking far too much. Right. So back in the 60s, you guys used to go to orgy parties, right? We went to the Wet Dream Festival in Amsterdam. <laughs> that was uh, Jermaine Greer was there and all sorts of famous people. And um, that was quite an experience. Tell me about that. That was difficult. I mean, you know, if, so it'd suddenly say, well, you, ha- you have to take your clothes off before you go into the party, and then, oh, well, shall we start now? And <laughs> <laughs> It was ridiculous. And all, at the door, you had to strip. The girls were allowed to keep their high heels on, and that's all. <laughs> oh the guys had to strip totally. You all go in Wander around with stand, limp dicks. It was really... <laughs> stand around there with champagne in your hand, making conversation, <laughs> as if you had your... It's a tuxedo on. Oh, my God. Then somebody would clap his hands and say, well, shall we start? And you'd have to put down your champagne, <laughs> grope the nearest girl. <laughs> it was bizarre. It really was. Oh, uh, it wasn't. We only did it for a short time. It was, But they pursued us. It was like a church. Yeah, when we came to America. Still people the, ringing us up from Long they Beach. Were, yeah, they would hook us up with people here and try and get us to go. It was just like a church. Yeah. It was really, um, every, every week you had to, had to turn up. I remember that time when the, the cops busted the one party? I wasn't there. Oh, that was in London, yes. Yeah. She wouldn't go after a while, but I went. <laughs> 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 and we were all standing there, standing around before the festivities began. Uh-huh. We were all standing around with glasses of champagne and making small talk about politics or something, and suddenly the door burst in and in came the Metropolitan Police in force. And were you guys all naked? Yes, of course. <laughs> all our shoes and clothes outside the door. Let's tell you. <laughs> Girls had their shoes on. I don't know. And they rushed in and they uh, said, this is a drug bust, this is a drug bust. And half of the... Cops were girls, and half of them were men. So you said, pat me down, baby. And they, and they said, well, this is proving rather difficult to search you people. You've got no clothes <laughs> on. <laughs> so they, eventually they confiscated the fish tank because there was a brown residue in the bottom of the fish tank. And I thought that maybe that was... Uh, Marijuana. Maro- no. Uh, Ash. Hashish. But they just hadn't cleaned the fish tank. They just hadn't cleaned the fish tank. So <laughs> oh there's these cops struggling out with this fish tank. <laughs> and that's all they got for their trouble. <laughs> oh, my God, what an incredible... And we just carried on and, had an, and never, never quit the party. Of course not. When the cops left, we got to it. <laughs> <laughs> that that is amazing. That is amazing. Uh, um. Okay, so tell me about uh, working at Hustler because you guys were there when Larry was going through his whole born again Christian thing, and when born he was a manic depressive, manic depressant, and like he all went, all that dra- all that drama. Yeah. yeah, I loved him, manic. He was really great. I remember in where was it, Cleveland? Yes, was it was that the way? Oh, Cincinnati, Cincinnati, Ohio, one of them. Yeah. And uh, we were all sitting there listening to him rambling away at the microphone. And Caesar was sitting in the front row. Heckling him. Heckling him. Of course. <laughs> and, he, and he said, if those people in the back don't shut up, in the back notice, don't shut up, we'll throw them out. But he never threw her out. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't dare. Because she was sitting in the front. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, he was, he was crazy. I mean, that's... That's why he got shot. He just walked down the street on his own thinking he was protected by God and 
That guy shot him. He, was, he kept coming out of the courthouse going to have lunch or something. And he was on a grapefruit diet at that time. Fortunately, so when the bullets ripped him apart, he didn't get septicemia. Because he didn't have anything in his stomach. nothing in his stomach. Wow, that's incredible. It's awful. Um, okay, so after he got shot, uh, what, was, what was that like? I mean, what was your reaction to that when you found out? Because you were, you were a staff photographer at Hustler at the time, right? Yes, yes. And I, I love Larry Flint because he never gave a shit about what anybody thought about him. That's why I liked him. He, um, oh, I was horrified. It was terrible. It was amazing that he, he lasted. But, of course, Althea took over while he was... His re- wife. His wife, recuperating... So, yeah, it was pretty, it was pre- pretty dodgy then. The whole place was full of coke. It was the cocaine days, weren't they? Coke days, yeah. Yeah, we didn't take coke, thank God. I mean, I would take anything, but Humphrey said he was allergic to it. So we didn't get into the coke games. But um, remember Bruce David turning his car on? the editor, of, the, editor publisher of Asla. Yeah, dear Bruce, he was great. He was round at our place uh, visiting, and uh, I walked him to his car. He rolled down the window, took the keys out of his pocket and leant in, stuck the keys in the ignition. I said, what are you doing? He said, in case Larry's planted a bomb in my car. He thought that Larry would have planted <laughs> no, a bomb? No, it was Larry's bodyguard, bodyguard. bodyguard. That, that bad guy. But everyone was just but paranoid But everybody was and bonkers, crazy. yeah. Paranoid and crazy. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So then after uh, Larry was shot and he was in a wheelchair, he got kind of a little, even more nuts, right? Yeah, that was the time when I, when I did a, the famous, probably the most famous Hustler cover, or the most notorious Hustler cover. Bruce asked me to do a list of cover ideas. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I did the, the famous Meat Grinder cover where there's a meat grinder on the cover and a girl with long legs disappearing into the meat grinder. It's the most notorious hustler cover. And that was your idea? It was my idea. And yet yeah. Nobody ever mentions that, ever. And I totally know that cover, and that is absolutely the most famous hustler cover of all time. Yeah. But I've never had ever heard you credited for that. Well, and- Bruce David knows, but he's unfortunately passed away now. But, uh, yeah, that was... I was very proud of that cover. <laughs> it's it's a pretty impactful cover. I mean, it definitely sends a message for well, sure. It's, what it's, was the title on it? The title what was, was uh, We Will No Longer Treat Women Like Pieces of Meat. Which is totally untrue. <laughs> it was just all crazy. Yeah. And then, um, and then didn't uh, Larry invite you over uh, to the mansion one time late at night under very suspicious circumstances? He rang you up. Oh, yeah, he was threatening me. What was that? Because I was shooting for other people, or what was that? I can't yeah, 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 he was shooting for other people. And there was a... He was fighting with Jim South, the agent. Over uh, models, right? Over models, yeah. Yeah. And you said to him... Uh, she, she said, Suze, you don't want to be caught up in the crossfire. She said, oh, Larry, if I get shot, you and I can have races in our weak gold wheelchairs. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed, and that was the end of his threats. Yeah, he, he was bonkers. Um, You're was probably that, one of the only people who has ever stood up to Larry. I mean, most people are terrified of yeah, him. Yeah. Uh, no, I just knew he was full of shit. He's, well, I don't think you're afraid of anybody. I've never seen anybody intimidate you ever. I think that I hope that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that's true. I mean there was even the time that you guys were pulled over um I remember this story when I was a kid. <laughs> you guys were pulled over for driving without your lights on and uh didn't the cop make you guys uh walk the line to make sure you weren't drunk and then you like took off. Oh, well, they made daddy, they made Humphrey They made walk. me walk the line because I was driving. Mm-hmm. And I was pretty pretty stunned. And then she, she the, then the cop sort of was watching, and then she, in high heels, follows me and mimics me <laughs> to walking the line. So she, he said, "Okay, you're drunk. 
put me in cuffs. She jumped, they jumped on the, waved down a passing bicyclist, motorcyclist. Motorcyclist. Jumped on the back and disappeared to get the lawyer. <laughs> this is Santa Monica I think that the cop was chasing me and left Daddy with it. <laughs> they tumbled me in the back of the back of the uh, paddy wagon, went down to Santa Monica jail or police station or whatever it was. And then I'd uh, threw me in the in the uh, cell, and, and he, then she walked in with a lawyer in tow. This is at about midnight. <laughs> Same Stephen Yagman. Same Stephen Yagman. <laughs> she talked them out of giving me bail or whatever. We all went home, slept happily on. Well, you were you were very good at avoiding, you know, when they make you do a breathalyzer, you know how to inhale and breathe. No, you just go. <laughs> yeah, and not, not put it through your it, lungs. Don't give it full lungs. It yeah, it just go through For all of you people who drive drunk, here are the tips on how to not get arrested from my parents. <laughs> Take a microdot of acid. Yeah. And that'll say. Or things. just don't drive drunk. There's that too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, your generation's really good I'm, I'm because we were really bad. I can't believe we survived, actually. So There's many. definitely a lot more rules in place now. Yeah. And a lot uh, stricter. You know, uh, with, with good reason. Yeah. yeah. We were bonkers. Yeah. It's kind of nuts. <laughs> so, um, okay. So you, you worked for Larry and then you, and then you went freelance, right? And you started working for Penthouse and High Society and just shooting for all the different magazines. Yes. Yeah. Who do you think was like your, f- do you have a favorite model of all time or a couple of favorites? Well, Tracy Lords was my favorite. But uh, I love Jenna Jameson. Anne Boleyn always made me laugh. Um, who else did I love? I mean, what I about saw Ginger? I mean, she's Gin- got really Ginger was a sweetie. Great stories about you. You know, she kind of credits you with uh, saving saving her ass in a time that she was really going into a dark place. Yeah. Well, a lot of the you know, I mean, it was real druggy times, and a lot of the people had had drug problems, so you had to resuscitate them and help them. <laughs> who was who the girl that um, used to go out with Bobby Vitale? Oh, Nikki. Um, oh, my God. Brianna. Oh, oh, uh, um, oh, my God. You Brianna did. Banks. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, because she passed out on me in a, in a shoot. And I had yeah. to resuscitate her. I, being a nurse was handy in those days. Yeah, she's back. She's sober now. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. So she seems to be doing well. Oh, good. They're all lovely girls, but it's 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 hard when you're growing up and got all these men and drugs and things around. Temptations. Temptations. Yeah, and a lot of these girls come from, you know, small towns or very conservative families. So, you know, it's the glitz and the glamour and everything is, is very new to them and, and intoxicating. I can definitely see how it's easy to fall into that. Oh, very easy from... For anybody, yeah. Huh. I mean, these so days, nice to be old. I'll tell you. <laughs> I mean, these days it's very much more a career-focused industry where you have a lot of girls who come in who are very much like in it for the long term. And I think because the internet has really allowed people to take control over their own careers, models specifically. You That's know, with, wonderful with camming yeah. and their yeah. direct access to fans and that kind of thing. So girls really come into this industry now with this. You know, idea of really treating it as a career, whereas before I think you know people kind of did it on the side just until making they some money until yeah. they figured out what they were going to do yeah. with their life. But now you know there's 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 more money in it for the models, but also too, um, I mean. The thing is now, like before, you could maybe model or do porn and maybe the entire world wouldn't see. And now, like, they will. Because now, because of the internet, whatever you do is on the internet forever. And there's just no escaping it, you know. And and there's no way that, like, your parents aren't going to find out, your friends aren't going to find out, your hometown's not going to find out, you know, that kind of thing. So there's so much more exposure now. It's always good to not try to hide things, though, because they always come up, you know. Yeah. My mother was quite proud of me. She used to ask me if I'd done any blue movies lately. I remember when she asked me, um, she was curious after I'd done a photo shoot because, you know, she never really looked at a lot of the things that you shot. And so she she asked me, she's like, oh, you know, I'm kind of interested. I kind of want to see, you know, the pictures that you take. And I'm like, okay, Graham Pam. And I started. Sh- I showed her like two, and she was done. She was like, "Okay, no, that's enough. I don't want to see anymore." 
<laughs> which you know was 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 funny but um and and then there was that oh my god that amazing poster that we found out we found later with Oma and Opa these are my dad's parents <laughs> um in bed with a bunch of porn around them remember it was like an advertising shot or yeah, something like that charity thing of some sort and i can't remember what the tagline was it was something like you're not too old to enjoy porn or something like that. And it was my grandparents in bed surrounded by porn. Like it was hilarious. That brings that back to me. Um, Now I'm the first child. So did you guys ever talk about like when you were going to tell me what you did for a living or was that ever a concern for you? Was that ever anything that, that came up, you know, like, okay, we're going to have a child, like, how do we bring, you know, how do we raise a child and work in porn at the same time? Was there ever any kind of issue with that? No, not really. I mean, we didn't really discuss it. I mean, we just winged it as we went along. But we always did keep our social life and our family life and our business life separate. I mean, I didn't mix very much with uh, the photographers or the models or anything. No, I didn't. I kept my family... My family was different, um, but I didn't didn't try to hide what I was doing either. It was just, and of course, you sneaky kids, you found out anyway. Um, but I wasn't trying to hide it. Um, yeah, I mean, because people, one of the some people try to hide it. There was that one photographer, really well, Michael known, Nin. Yeah, who who hid it from his kids. That's a terrible. Yeah, I terrible remember he had, he had kids, and he was asking in. about like, how do I you know, tell my kids what I do for a living. And we were just kind of like, I don't know. We've always known. Yeah. And one of the, the, the most common question that I get is, when did you know what your parents did for a living? And there's never been a time where I like, there was no epiphany. Yeah. There was no moment where I was like, no, well, oh my I, God, I just sort of always knew. I, I would be shooting. How. I had a daylight studio in the backyard. I'd be shooting there and you weren't supposed to go out, but I'm sure you snuck a peek. I'd be shooting play playgirl pictures back there. Well, according to okay, so according to Randy West, he met me when I was like five. So the first AVN um, show that I went to with my parents, I met Randy West, who was a very famous porn star back in the day. He was actually the one who I think did the first thing with Jenna Jameson. Yeah, I think he discovered her for Dirty, yeah. dirty Debutantes. I, I don't believe. Remember. But anyway, so he was a very famous porn star back in the day. And when I met him, he was like, "Oh, we've met before." And I was like, "I really?" And he said, "Yeah, like your." Mom Mom was shooting me for Playgirl. That's right. In your backyard, and you were like, you came out. You were like a kid, and you like came running out, and you're like, hi. And <laughs> you said it's like I was naked, and it was awkward. You're like this child. <laughs> I don't, of course, remember that at all. But apparently, of course, that it didn't happened. strike you as anything unusual. You know? His we knew him. Well, the, yeah, that's true. I mean, you guys up. are both nudists, so you yeah. guys were always naked. So, like, seeing naked people wasn't weird to me. Mm-hmm. Anyways. I remember actually you guys had a model who stayed, and you would have models that would stay with us. And there was this one girl who had an iguana who was obsessed with. Like she just, she had an iguana, which first of all made her so fucking cool. Um, and I remember uh, just like, I just thought she was the most beautiful thing in the world. And I remember actually she took a shower and I was in the bathroom with her and I was talking to her and she was like showering and and I don't know, she just, she got dressed in front of me and I was like, oh my God, you're so beautiful. And I just, she was just, she was so cool. She was so cool. You don't remember who that was, huh? Because no, I don't remember. No, I but I just remember Amber she would probably she had an iguana, a pet iguana. There was one who had a leopard. Oh my God, that is a great story. When so tell it, us that story. Oh, went down to Fulbrook with her. Oh, that was with a leopard in the and back seat. She had that a leopard so, in the that, back That's the only time I've been scared. This is the worst experience in porn. Yeah. She had a leopard at the bed. Every now and then the leopard would go, tap you on the shoulder. I was frightened of that. So you guys were, okay, so you're in a car. Let's just set the stage. You're in a car. You're driving to what, Palm Springs? All three sitting in the front seat. Down to Fallbrook, I think we were going. Fallbrook, yeah. Yeah. All three sitting in the front seat, and she has a leopard in the the back seat. A pet baby leopard. A pet baby leopard, and it just kept swatting you in the back of the head. You're in a playful way, you know. But weren't you guys also like on acid or something like that? Probably. Or like high on shrooms? I I swear you told me you were like tripping. And the fact that there was like a leopard in the backseat just made it like that much worse. Very scary. Very scary. I wouldn't recommend it. You wouldn't (laughs) recommend a road trip with a leopard. (laughs) 
Oh, dear. Um, okay, so so from okay, so you obviously had a very successful career, Mom, as a photographer, and uh, then the internet came along. Nineteen ninety eight is that when you guys yeah. launched Susanet? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that because that was kind of a big surprise and a big life changer for you guys. Yeah, it all began really. I got to thank Danny Ash for this. He had a website called Danny dot com those days. And um, they used to, she used to license pictures from us for use on the internet. So there I was licensing pictures away to people and not really making serious bucks out of it. So I said, don't you think that we, do you think, Danny, that we should put up a website of our own? And she said in later years, that's the, that's the, a good example of that no deed goes that good deed goes unpunished <laughs> because we soon out built up a, yeah uh, built a website which out, eclipsed everybody yeah and we you, went, did all, you did all that bit, it, it, it. and it all happened three months before Google went up so we beat Google by th- three months wow in 19, end of 1998. And what was so, and, and what I think really lent itself to the success of your website, I mean, it's very much being in the right place at the right time, yes. was the fact that you owned all of your pictures. So that was a huge thing. So you had a huge because library. Because I fought with all the big boys. And <laughs> back then, the technology, the bandwidth wasn't so good that you could download video. Like video was not accessible at all. You could only do pictures, and even pictures took forever to download. Your video went down at 50K. Yeah. That was your little thing the side of a paying card. Yeah. Was your screen. And it would still take forever and, and to download. It would take forever to download. It was right. all smudgy and horrible. Yeah. So really like photos were like the big thing. And, and you had a thing. huge library. And, you know, you'd shot all the biggest stars. So you guys started Suze.net not really knowing what the hell you were doing. And it just like kind of blew up right away, right? I mean, you guys oh, were just the, making... The way the money came in, it was embarrassing. We were making eight thousand dollars a day. That's insane. I spent it all on horses. <laughs> <laughs> she had twenty horses. Eighteen, I think, actually was the official count, but close enough. Uh, it was breeding like it was the sixties. Because your children weren't so. <laughs> <laughs> Empty nest syndrome with baby with uh, horses. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, so I mean, Suze.net just like kind of blew up, and then um, and that's and then I came in. What like. Two years later, not even a year later, I started working for you guys pretty early. Two thousand or so. Okay, so like two years. Two years, yeah. I couldn't keep you out. I mean, I really thought that children would rebel against their parents. I never thought that Holly would become a photographer. That she would be a writer, and she's really great writer. She's really smart. But she insisted. It's terrible. Okay, first of all, I didn't insist. It was dad who talked me into moving down here and working for you guys. Dad told me that he was going to get me an apartment in Malibu in a Ferrari. And I got to oh. move into the guest house at Charnock and I got a Ford Explorer. <laughs> <laughs> but I, so I was going to Brooks Institute at the time uh, of photography. And I just, I really didn't feel like I fit in there. You know, it was very much a commercially based school and it, it put out a lot of like wedding photographers and commercial photographers. And um, I don't know, I just, I just wasn't, I wasn't into it. I, I, I didn't feel like I was learning anything really um, significant. And then, uh, you know, they, they asked me to come down and, and help out with the website a little bit. And at first I was just going to do some office admin stuff. Um, I wasn't going to shoot. And so I decided, okay, it's time for me to leave Santa Barbara. And I, and I moved back down to LA, but I wasn't going to, you know, I still was going to college. I went to Santa Barbara. Well, I was going to Santa Barbara city college and then Brooks. And then I moved down here and I went to Santa Monica city college. And then I ended up transferring to UCLA and graduating there with a degree in world literature in 2003, simply because I wanted a college degree. I just felt like that was important. It wasn't because I was going to do anything with that because <laughs> back then I, w- I was already working for you guys. And so I kind of knew where I was, where I was going. Um, but I, I did start working for you guys without the intention of staying. You know, I thought I was going to, I guess I thought I was going to be a fashion photographer or something like that. And I just found that the job really kind of suited me. You know, I really liked the environment that, that you created. You I have more control. 
I, I grew up in very much uh, what I call the Suze bubble, which I still kind of work in today, you know, where, you know, we worked with the best girls. We had a stylist, we had a set designer, we had incredible locations, you know, and it was like, it, it was so much fun. I mean, we could just come in to work and be like, what are we going to shoot next week? Like, what concepts are we going to do? I mean, everything was up to us, you know, we could do anything that we wanted. And, um, and, you know, make money off of it. And it was incredible. Yeah. It was so much fun. And then, you know, obviously things changed and, um, you know, a competition got really fierce and video came in. And that was something that, you know, I didn't know anything about and we didn't really know anything about. But I saw that the industry was moving in that direction. So I just started teaching myself video. I just started shooting. I just picked up a camera. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And I just started and, you know, I just try. I just learned as I went along. It's funny when I look back at my, my early videos that I shot shot, holy shit, are they terrible. The mic is like really far away from the model. There's like cords in the shot. I have like no idea what I'm doing. But, um, you know, it's something that I've, I've learned a lot about. I've been forced to learn a lot about recently. And, um, you know, I think my video work is much improved. But at, at my heart, I still feel like I'm very much a photographer. Like that's, you know, really where my, my strength lies. But um, yeah, so, you know, I was, I was able to work in an environment that was, you know, completely structured by you. We had, you know, our own people that we worked with. And um, that's something that I've kind of replicated now in my career. You know, I'm very picky about the people that I have on set, very picky about the makeup artists, my assistants, that kind of stuff. And I've really created my own kind of world, the safe space, you know, where I feel that women um, have the opportunity to be sexually open and free and feel very safe about it. And that was something that, that you taught me. And, you know, I haven't been on many other porn sets because obviously why would I be? But there's been a couple that I've stumbled onto for whatever reason. And I have to say that sometimes the industry itself just grosses me out. I mean, the way that a lot of the producers, directors, photographers speak to their talent, treat their talent, um, is abhorrent to me. Um, just the locations that people shoot at is gross. Just, it's just very, I guess like what you would imagine a porn set would be like, um, that to me was just like, I couldn't, like if I, if I didn't grow up in the environment the very unique environment that you created with porn, I'd, I don't think I could do it. Well, you're only as good as your model feels, you know? Yeah, that's so absolutely that's... true. And that's something that I very much learned from you because you know, it's so important to, for me, there is a certain amount of trust that the model automatically places in you when you shoot her naked. You know, she's showing her most vulnerable side to you. She's being very open with you in more ways than one. And, um, you know, she trusts you to... To make her look and feel beautiful. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And I think... A lot of guys don't see that. I, yeah, I agree. I think they don't they, see they that. Don't and I think that that's They don't have a woman's eye. They, they don't understand how important that trust is that that model has given you is. And, you know, that's something that I really treasure. And I really, you know, hope that I can... I always want the model to walk away from my shoots feeling like... Proud. She had a great time. Proud. Yeah. Proud of what she shot. Excited to yeah. see what she did, you know, I never want a girl to walk away and feel like, I wish I hadn't done that. It's really, I mean, when it's really great, I mean, it's not always great. You've got to get rapport between people, but it's like a sexual Olympics. Sometimes yeah. it's amazing. You just put your camera down and say, oh, I just got to watch. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's some pretty incredible stuff that yeah. um, we've been witness to for sure. Um, when the chemistry is right between the performers, it can yeah. be an amazing thing. Amazing. Um, Okay, so uh, let's talk about let's talk about me. Um, so, it, are you guys like? Do you wish I had done something else with my life? Yes, I wanted you to be a writer. <laughs> I wanted you to. Yeah, I think you're an amazing writer. <sighs> I haven't written anything in so long. I know, <laughs> I know, but you just don't do what you're told. Yeah, I know. It's unfortunate. I, I, get, get I, get that, I get that from you. <laughs> uh, I mean, what about you, Dad? Do you do you wish I had done something else with my life? Or do you think that... I mean, are you guys proud of me? Like, do you... Oh, you're really good. I mean, at least you know what you're doing. I never did. I just had to joke it off. <laughs> no, you, no, you're really... And you work really hard. And I just feel that you should get more 
rewarded more. It's just so much stress out there and so much, yeah, so much hard work. But um, you'll get there, especially if you, you write have... your f- memoirs. All right. I wish you had the kind of break that we had with Suzette. Yeah, yeah, that was a break. Yeah, that really kicked our asses right up there. Yeah, you guys got very lucky with that. I mean, and right time, right place. Extraordinary. I mean, once in a lifetime type thing. Yeah. Doesn't happen to anybody, hardly anybody. That you know, get such a tremendous boost out of nowhere. Yeah. But at least, I mean, the main thing is to do something that you love, so, you know, that you enjoy. It's really important. And yeah. this is a, it, it's a great business. I mean, the joy of, I mean, I never used to look at my pictures afterwards. It's just the moment in just of when it happens and the the joy that's there for then and then you walk on it's it's great it's interesting because i'm i'm the opposite it's i really enjoy looking at the pictures afterwards as opposed to taking them at the time i mean i obviously don't mind taking them at the time but like for me the real reward is seeing the finished product is seeing the results of the hard work not being in the moment. So it's interesting. I'm completely yeah, the you're opposite. You're a true artist. Your mother's just a rebel rouser. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a cheerleader. <laughs> um, so who do you think I'm the most like? Do you think I'm the most like mom or dad? You're an unfortunate mixture of both of us. <laughs> You've got your father's brains, thank God. Not his legs, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I do feel like I'm... I'm the perfect mix between you guys. I used to think I was more like my dad, um, but then as I started my own career and became more career-oriented, I found myself being very much like my mother in a lot of senses. And um, I I definitely hear myself a lot of times be like, fuck, I sound just like my mom. (laughs) Or like I watch myself on on video or TV, I'm like, oh my God, I'm just like my mother. Oh my God. (laughs) But I think it's like kind of inevitable thing, you know, that you end up like your parents. And I mean, I'm super lucky to have amazing parents. I mean, you guys must know how cool you are. I mean, everybody is like so jealous of me that I just have such incredible parents. And, you know, I have parents that are so supportive. Well, we're opposites. We're opposites too. And that really helps. You yeah. Know, you know, Humphrey's got long legs and big brains and I am, I'm the joker. <laughs> Short legs and small brain. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also you asked creep- for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you walk right into that, mom. Uh, that's okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, you know, I mean, okay. So I want to talk. I want to tell one of my favorite stories about my dad, and this might make me cry. Um, but I just kind of want to give everybody a sense of you know what an amazing childhood I had. Um, I, I just feel so lucky, you know, so many people these days come from broken homes, from broken families. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I grew up the daughter of pornographers and most people would assume that that would mean that I had some like tumultuous childhood and I was subject to like sexual abuse or something like that. None, nothing could be further from the truth. I had a wonderful childhood. I am not the victim of any kind of abuse in any way whatsoever. And, um, you know, I just... I mean, it's interesting because I think also being the first child, you guys really wanted to bring up a cultured individual. I mean, I went to Cotillion. You guys (laughs) sent me to Cotillion when I was a kid, you know, and, and, um, you know, grades were very important. I had tutors and, you know, I was, if I got C's were not allowed, B's were tolerated, but A's were preferable, um, you guys were always very strict about education. I wasn't allowed to watch TV. Really, when I was a kid, I was only allowed to watch TV on the weekends, um, Saturday and Sunday morning cartoons before 10 a.m. and then after 4 p.m. And even then they were picky about like what kind of shows that I watched. I wasn't allowed well, to watch we anything. We grew up they... without TV. Yeah, so, and uh, uh, I think that's a great thing. You know, yeah. everybody watches way too much TV these days. Yeah, your father included. Yeah, yeah, Making these days. Lost time. Well, you're just <laughs> watching CNN and the debacle with Trump unravel. <laughs> but we won't get into politics. No. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, we, you guys read me a bedtime story every night. Um, I remember we would go to Venice Beach every Sunday or every Saturday, and then we would have Sunday lunch every Sunday. And, you know, I had a very stable, normal childhood. Um, one of the things, 
that I struggled with as a child was I was um, very socially awkward and I was um, unpopular in school. I skipped first grade because... It was my fault because I was so proud. I had this very bright child. So I pushed a a grade ahead. That was the stupidest thing ever. It was... Because brains, it's it's socializing is the important thing. Academically, it wasn't hard for me, but socially it was very uh, difficult for me. Yeah, no, it was a big mistake. Uh, I really apologize for that. It's it's okay. Oh, (laughs) I'm I'm over it now. (laughs) But, you know, like when I was a kid, it was very socially awkward. Didn't have a lot of friends. Boys definitely did not like me. I was... You had frizzy hair, overbite, I didn't know how to dress, all of those things. And uh, I remember Valentine's Day specifically being like the worst holiday ever because the teachers would make us sit around and write out Valentine's cards for people in our class that we liked. And then I remember we would like create this little box that we would like hang or tape to the edge of the table um, in arts and crafts. And then like people would come by and drop Valentine's cards in it, you know, at a certain point of the day the teacher would say okay everyone take your valentine's cards out and drop it in the you know the box on the desk of the person that you want to give the valentine's that's a terrible to terrible thing to do guess who didn't get any valentine's oh, cards oh that's what a stupid thing Me. for teachers to do i actually got one valentine's oh. day card from the girl in the class that gave valentine's day cards to everybody <laughs> So, and then I think I got one from the teacher and that was it. And I remember specifically like this boy, Francisco, I had a huge crush on. And I remember him walking like in my direction with like a card in his hand. And I remember like at the moment it like became that kind of slow motion. And I was like, oh, he's going to put it in my box. He's going to put it in my box. And he didn't. He put it in the box of the girl with the desk next to me. And I was like heartbroken. So... Anyhow, so I hated Valentine's Day. So one Valentine's Day, I get this mystery card that was mailed to me. And, you know, as a kid, getting mail is super exciting, um, especially before the days of the internet, you know, when you wouldn't get emails, you would get mail. And, um, and I opened it, and it was from a secret admirer. And it said, you know, that they thought I was the most beautiful girl in the world, and I was so smart, and I was so pretty, and I was very special. And, you know, that they loved me very much, but they were, you know, a secret admirer, so they wouldn't tell me who they were. And I remember being so excited about this. I was like, oh, my God, a boy likes me. This is incredible. And showing it to my parents and trying to figure out who it was. And, you know, nobody had any answers. And and then the next year I got the same card. And that happened for a couple of years. And then um, when I got older, I realized that the handwriting was sort of familiar And then I realized it was my father who had been sending me these Valentine's Day cards. And I told you I was going to cry. But like the fact that my dad would like write me this card about how special he thought I was and would like drive across town to mail it back to my house so that I felt that I was loved. Because I knew I was loved by my parents, but you know when you're a kid, like that doesn't really matter, you know what I mean? You want to be loved by society and your friends and all that kind of stuff. You don't appreciate the love of your parents until you're when you're older. And, you know, I think my dad kind of recognized that. And when I realized that it was my dad who'd been sending me these cards, it was just like, it was so much more special to me because, you know, before I thought it was like this mystery boy who liked me, But then I realized it was my father who loved me so much that he would go out of his way to mail me these Valentine's Day cards that made me feel so special. And and like, he's like all uncomfortable looking out the window, but like dad, I'll never forget that. Like that was an amazing thing to do. And it's like, I love you so much. No, shucks. Okay. I knew, I knew I was going to cry when I told that story. Anyways. (laughs) Um, Okay, I think that's kind of. I, I think that's now that I've cried and I've edited it's a good stop. Really, it's a good stop. To stop. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, um, yeah, I think that's. I think that's all the questions I have for you guys. I can't oh, think of baby. anything else except for thank you so much for just like giving me an amazing life and being such a rad, I mean, I have a rad family and it's interesting too, because my brother and my sister are not involved in the industry at all. My brother's a lawyer, my sister's a nurse. So, you know, I really do feel like we were raised, you know, just with a very normal life, normal childhood, um, whatever you think normal is. But, um, you know, my siblings are very normal and I guess I'm normal, even though my job is weird, I'm 
I feel like I'm pretty normal. Y- I'm not you're that super normal. Super normal. <laughs> Above normal. Above normal. <laughs> Paranormal. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, I, I just feel like, I think I'm also lucky too because, you know, I work in the adult industry and I obviously have the full support of my friends and my family, which a lot of people don't have. So um, I feel very fortunate for that. And I feel very much like, you know, I just have a very unique experience compared to most people. Well, most people come from divorced families. I mean, that's, yeah. we're, we're, we're very middle-aged I mean, middle, middle um, England, middle class, very, very... It's interesting because I actually just read this article, um, Kirk and Ann Douglas, uh, just, you know, famous, Kirk Douglas, famous movie star, mm. um, Michael Douglas's father mm-hmm. and mother. Uh, and they just came out with a book and um, Ann was talking about how, what made the headline with the book was how Ann talked about how turning a blind eye to her husband's infidelities is what kind of saved their marriage. And, um, you know, because it's interesting because, you know, growing up with parents who are not from here and growing up in America, like I've had a kind of very dual um, existence in terms of like American values and like English values. And, um, America is incredibly uptight about sex. Like, but it's interesting. It's like, it's the country that consumes the most amount of porn, but it's also the country that is like the most anti porn in a way. And it's really bizarre, like the way that, the, how Those backwards two we are. Go together, though. Yeah. It's, and the oppression English are, leads to revolt. Yeah. The English really feel, you know, you can do whatever you like as long as you don't frighten the horses. <laughs> <laughs> That is a good. That is a good quote. Take <laughs> put that on a shirt. But um, Anne Anne said, uh, and I quote: "She said, as a European, I understand it was unrealistic to expect total fidelity in a marriage, and that is something you know that I've mm. kind of struggled with because I mean everybody knows. Well, everybody who knows me knows I'm kind of a commitment phobe, and I'm not very good at relationships. And um, you know, the idea of committing to having sex with one person for the rest of your life kind of makes me feel trapped because that just seems." <laughs> totally unrealistic to me. Um, and I think that's very much an, a, an American value, you know, more than, than some other cultures. And is yeah, that... I mean, men have always gone off and had affairs and things, you know. Unfortunately, biologically, I mean, that's kind of the way that, that men and women are structured. Men are, are built to basically sow their seed all yes. over the place for the sake of human procreation. And, and women are kind of more biologically inclined to be the homemaker and stay at home and take care of the, the family. And it's just up. like, yeah. it's just the way that, you know, like human biology um, was made. And obviously, you know, we're um, intelligent creatures and we go, you know, and we make, we make ourselves into whoever we want to be. You know, we have that intellectual ability, but, you know, you can't deny like our basic biological urges, which kind of pull us back all the time. And, um, yeah, I mean, the fact that you guys kind of had an open relationship, um, I've always kind of envied that. I've never been able to duplicate such a thing. Well, it's hard to do that these days because of sexually transmitted diseases, yeah. whereas we didn't know anything about that, you know, although we occasionally get crabs or whatever. <laughs> hey, he's got some crabs every once in a while, no big deal. Nah. <laughs> Nothing that a good, good like, comb out can't do, a little shave. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's amazing to think that that was the only thing that you guys had to worry about, and now we have to worry about HIV and well, and syphilis too. But HIV wasn't 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 around. And uh, what's the other thing? STD. Yeah, what and STDs? Herpes and things. Herpes, like, chlamydia, really, gonorrhea, yeah. all that stuff. It's all our fault because we spread it all around, and then <laughs> now you guys have got to remain faithful. It's, I'm sorry. Damn it. All right. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you guys so much for doing my very first podcast. It was amazing. I love you both so much. So proud of you. um, I'm just, I'm really excited. I think this was a great interview, and I hope that the rest of you guys really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Mm